questions. What would happen if the Earth suddenly stopped spinning? Our planet rotates at over 1,000 miles per hour, or almost twice the speed of a jumbo jet. That's super, super fast! As you might have noticed, we don't actually feel ourselves moving while the Earth turns. It's like being inside a car. While you're driving, you don't feel the car whiz down the road. But as soon as you hit the brakes, suddenly you have a sense of just how fast you were moving. If the Earth suddenly stopped spinning, two horrible things would happen. The first is that everything would be launched sideways at over 1,000 miles per hour. And we mean everything. The force of the sudden stop would be so strong that plants, animals, buildings, even entire oceans would be shot into sudden, destructive motion. And if you manage to survive being thrown sideways at unsurvivable speeds, that would only be the beginning of your no good, very bad day. Once the Earth stops spinning, a single day would last one full year. It takes the Earth 24 hours to do one complete spin. But if the Earth stops spinning, we'd have to wait for one full rotation around the sun for that day to end. So basically, one side of the Earth would bake in the relentless burning sun for a year, while the other side would descend into a freezing icecape of darkness. And if this sounds like a horrific, unsurvivable nightmare scenario, then congratulations, you've been listening. The good news is that it's basically impossible for the Earth to suddenly stop spinning. Since the Earth is so big, the energy you'd need is so much that whatever caused it to stop is probably way scarier. Feel better? I didn't think so. Where do rainbows really come from? In order to understand rainbows, we need to go back to the year 1666, when a scientist named Isaac Newton made an important discovery about light. He realized that the white light we call sunshine is actually made of all different colors put together. He proved it by using a triangular piece of glass called a prism. If you shine white light through a prism, it splits into seven separate bands of color, and you might be able to guess them. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Rainbows naturally form in pretty much the same way. Whenever it rains, the air is full of moisture and raindrops. If there happens to be some sunshine while the air is still wet, each of those raindrops acts like its own mini prism. When sunlight hits the raindrops in exactly the right spot, the light is split into a band of colors that arcs through the sky with the same seven colors. You can see a rainbow anytime there's water droplets in the air and the sun is shining behind you at a nice low angle. The most vivid and visible rainbows occur while the sky is still dark and stormy. The sun shining on a dark background makes for an extra bright and colorful sight. Okay, so that's how rainbows are formed, but how do you find that pot of gold at the end? Well, unfortunately, that's not something you'll ever be able to do. You see, Rainbows don't have any real beginning or end. In fact, they don't really exist in any actual location in the sky. Seeing a rainbow is all about reflecting light at just the right angle, so its location looks different depending on where you're standing. So next time you happen to catch a glimpse of rainbow, just enjoy it and leave the gold for the leprechauns. Have you ever wondered what the sun is made of? Life on Earth simply wouldn't be possible without our sun shining in the sky. It provides the light and warmth needed to survive and thrive. Even from afar, experts have been able to do tons of research on the sun, its surface, and what exactly it's made of. For starters, the sun doesn't have a hard surface to land on, but it's also not just a giant ocean of liquid hot lava. Instead, the sun is mostly made up of two basic gases, hydrogen and helium. The flaming ball of orange energy we see in the sky is really just the result of the hydrogen and helium gas mixing in the sun's core. This causes a never-ending nuclear reaction that's kind of like millions of atomic bombs going off all the time. Those nuclear reactions all release enormous amounts of energy into space. Scientists call that energy electromagnetic radiation. 
and it reaches Earth's atmosphere in the form of light and heat. And it might be hard to believe, but experts consider our sun to be medium-sized and on the cooler side compared to the biggest, hottest stars in the galaxy. The hottest stars don't burn a golden yellow like the sun. Instead, they glow a bright blue. And stars that are even cooler than the sun are more of a reddish color. But in this case, cooler stars still burn at about 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So, still pretty scorching. So, now that you know our sun is just a giant burning ball of explosive energy, maybe you'll remember to wear sunscreen on those hot summer days. Have you wondered why some leaves change color and fall off the tree every year? You probably know that not every tree drops its leaves each year. Evergreen trees, like pine trees, see their needles all year long. The kind of tree that loses their leaves are called deciduous trees. Believe it or not, trees actually use their leaves to help them eat. You see, leaves take in light from the sun and transform all the energy from the sunlight into food for the tree. Trees and other plants eat using a special process called photosynthesis. The leaves sit in the sun all day long, turning all that sunlight into energy. All that sun soaking is actually hard work for leaves. So it takes plenty of water to keep them healthy and functioning. So when the weather starts to get cold in the fall months as winter approaches, the air gets drier and drier as it gets colder, which leaves less water for the trees to suck up. With less water available, the leaves will begin to get dry, damaged, and will eventually die. So trees spring into action before that happens and start getting prepared early once the air first starts to cool down. They take all of the nutrients that are left in their leaves and start to recycle it back into the branches, trunk, and roots to help the tree survive during the colder months when it can't eat anymore. All those good nutrients being leached out of the leaves causes them to dry out and change color. Now that there's nothing left for the dry, damaged leaf to do, the tree cuts it off and waits for them to fall off on their own. Now that the tree is leafless and can't eat during the coldest months, it basically goes into hibernation. That means, just like a bear, trees go dormant to preserve their limited stores of food. And as the air starts to warm up in the spring, the trees wake back up from their hibernation and get to work growing brand new leaves. So why do leaves change to those beautiful colors? Because they've been drained of their life force. Morbid? Maybe, but no less interesting. What causes a tornado in the first place? Whether you call them twisters, cyclones, or tornadoes, they're all the same. Giant, powerful, rotating columns of air that emerge out of a thunderstorm and reach down to the ground, spinning and sucking up dust, dirt, and debris as they whirl. But it takes more than just a thunderstorm to make a tornado. A few other things need to happen at the same time to create the perfect storm. First, a thunderstorm needs to start, usually in the spring or summer. Then there needs to be a sudden change in wind direction and an increase in wind speed that causes the air in the thunderstorm clouds to start swirling faster and faster. Next, rising warm air from the ground literally tips the quick swirling air over. All that spinning forms a funnel that starts to suck up even more warm air from the ground. That funnel of spinning air keeps getting longer and longer while spinning until it finally touches the ground, officially becoming a tornado. Their strength is measured on a scale called the Enhanced Fujita Scale, which are split into six categories, each stronger and more dangerous than the last. An EF-0 and 1 tornado are considered fairly weak and likely won't do much damage, if any. EF-2 and 3 are strong, with winds well over 100 miles per hour. The two most dangerous types of tornadoes on the scale are EF-4 and 5. EF-5's, the largest category, is any tornado with winds over 200 miles per hour. Only about 2% of tornadoes ever get this strong. The strongest tornadoes can knock over trees, rip apart roofs, 
bring down buildings and even send cars or trucks flying through the air. Tornadoes can form on almost every continent, but about three quarters of them appear over the United States in an area called Tornado Alley that extends from South Dakota all the way down to Texas. The widest tornado ever formed was back in 2013 in El Reno, Oklahoma. That category EF5 tornado had winds over 295 miles per hour and was over two miles long and traveled more than 16 miles in just 40 minutes. Poor Oklahoma can't catch a break because the fastest tornado wind speeds ever recorded were in the Sooner State as well. The Bridge Creek Moor Twister on May 3rd, 1999 had unbelievable wind speeds of 318 miles per hour, the highest ever recorded. So next time you're in your cellar hiding from a terrible tornado, at least you'll understand how it happened. Not that it'll help. What causes some trees to stay green all year round? There are two basic types of trees. The first are called deciduous trees, which are any tree that seasonally shed all their leaves, usually in the fall as the weather starts to get colder. These trees have big, wide leaves that change colors before they drop. The other basic type of tree is called an evergreen, which are any trees you see that keep their leaves or needles year round. But that doesn't mean they never drop their leaves. Instead of shedding as it gets cold out, evergreens just drop a few leaves here or there all year while new ones grow in. Kind of like how our hair grows on our heads. Okay, so now we know what kind of tree stays green all the time, but why? Why do some trees lose their leaves while others keep them? Well, that has to do with how different trees keep their energy in the harsh winter months. You see, trees eat and get their energy from the same two places most plants do, water and the sun. They take in sunlight from the sun and water from the ground and convert it into energy. You might have heard of this process before. It's called photosynthesis. So trees need plenty of light to stay fed. But as the colder months approach, the days shorten, meaning less sunlight. Less sunlight means less energy for trees. Deciduous and evergreen trees handle this problem in different ways. Since deciduous trees have big leaves that take lots of energy to maintain, they simply close up the holes where the leaves attach to the tree to conserve moisture. By the time the coldest months of winter hit, deciduous trees have completely closed up shop to stash away as much energy as they can until the weather warms, the rain starts to fall, and the sun starts to shine. Evergreen trees, on the other hand, don't need to drop their leaves as it gets colder, drier, and darker. That's because evergreens are much better designed to handle the winter. They have very strong, sturdy, waxy leaves that are rolled up so tight they look like needles more than leaves. Those little needles need way less water than a big, fat leaf so the tree doesn't need to drop them all. So next time you're decorating a Christmas tree and one of those pine needles pricks you as you hang an ornament, well, at least you'll know why pine trees have those pesky pokers. <laughs>